Best Book Bits podcast brings you David McRaney, author of three books. You're not so smart, you are now less dumb, and you can beat your brain. David, thanks for being on the sh- podcast. Hey, great to be here. So happy to uh, to sync up over all these massive time zone differences. It's really cool. Absolutely. I'm from Melbourne, Australia. You're from uh, New Orleans at the moment. So tell us a little bit about yourself, your story, where it all kicked off. Who is David in his 20s? Oh, wow. Let's go back in time. Uh, in my 20s, I owned pet stores, of all things. Uh, I had two pet stores in two different cities. Um, I, had, uh, I was in a terrible car wreck when I was 18. And uh, when I finally got out of all the rehabilitation required to get me back walking, uh, I took the settlement money from getting hit head on by an 18 wheeler on a back road uh and bought a pet store with it and then did that for a couple uh years and from there i um i actually went to university later in life instead of uh in my mid-20s and i was working on a um, psychology degree whenever uh, i sold the pet stores and i was working on a psychology degree and i started working for the school newspaper the university newspaper and quickly moved up through the ranks of that through news editor then executive editor and uh just really uh took to it and that so i went into uh newspapers after that i worked for a couple of different newspapers uh right after hurricane katrina so that was a nice trial by fire and from there i uh, uh went to work for television stations where i was teaching them how to write for the web teaching them how to, um, the, at the early web, whenever you could be a, a web guru. I, I moved up into uh, being the head of uh, digital for a, uh, news, for a television station, uh, for a television conglomerate. And um, I was working, I was managing all their social media. And it was, that, it was then that I was introduced to the weirdness of, of human beings arguing on the internet. And uh, since I had a, a psychology background, I started a blog about all of that uh, called You Are Not So Smart. And it was about biases and fallacies and heuristics and all the kind of weird stuff we do whenever we disagree. And um, it just took off and it became popular in that period of time that podcasts, I mean, not, not podcasts, but uh, blogs where there was a period of time, if you remember around 2008 and seven, eight, nine in there, where uh, blogs were getting book deals and uh there were several there were uh stuff white people like uh shit my dad says um awkward family photos they i got swept up into that and my blog became a book and that book just uh, again i was lucky several times the the book became extremely popular to the point that it uh was published in um it's been published almost in 20 languages now and it's uh it's currently like number one in in vietnam it keeps getting this new life because a lot of the material is very evergreen um that led to me wanting to start a podcast to promote the second book you are now less dumb which is just uh sort of more of the same of the first but a little bit a little bit better written and uh the podcast i got into podcasting right when that became popular uh when that was, was in the first wave of the of uh things like uh, Mark Marin and, and uh, actually who, who I reached out to who helped me set up my, my podcast. And then uh, I've been doing, the, as that became popular, I had more access and was learning more about psychology and neuroscience and sociology and political science. I decided I wanted to write a book about uh, how people do and do not change their minds, how social change takes pl- takes place, how very fast social changes can take place after long periods of um, of struggle with the status quo. And uh, so for the last five years, I worked on that. But that book's very different from my last two books. This book goes back to sort of my roots as a journalist. And I went out and met people. I went to Westboro Baptist Church and I went to uh, I met 9-11 truthers and anti-vaxxers and flat earthers. And then I also spent time with activists and persuasion experts. And I just uh, spent years meeting people in uh, in real life, as they would say, in meat space uh, leading up to the, the great uh shutdown of uh, COVID. And so uh, I just, I, that's been sent off and that will be coming out uh, soon. So there, that's the short, awesome. that's the short that's, version. That's uh thank you for the intro. That's, that's brilliant. I, uh, I love how you went from, you know, such a, a trauma with a car accident to owning the pet store to go to there and, you know, looking back, connecting the dots, you can sort of go, wow, what a, what a story. But at the time, I'm sure you wouldn't have realized that <laughs> all the dots connecting to sort of where you are right now. It's true. Um, we, we can go back and unpack that. But I, I want to talk about, uh, yeah, your new book sort of coming out. 
which is how minds change. Mm-hmm. And you've you've hit on a few points with um, with the conspiracies. Uh, I myself am and a and a like yourself, I'm a bit of a, a connoisseur of conspiracies <laughs> and understand a, a lot of it and done a lot of research as well. Um, I sort of look at things the Robert Kiyosaki way. You know, there's three sides to a coin. You've got heads, tails, and you've got the edge. And the edge is a very, very fine, very, very fine side where you can sit on the edge and and understand both sides, but not necessarily have your feet in one side of belief on one way or the other. Um, Tell us a little bit about more about that book coming out, How Minds Change, and tell us some stories uh, of people that you've met on the journey as well. Um, The... um the book uh, has a, a number of sort of communities. Like not only I spend a lot of time with, with conspiratorial communities or people, and then also spend a lot of time with people who have changed their minds in, in drastic ways. Oftentimes people who've left those communities. Um, and then with scientists and experts who study that sort of thing. And then also activists and people who use persuasion techniques that uh, are being studied right now uh, by different uh, experts to understand why they're so powerful. Um, I start the book out with a, a, a 9-11 truth or of someone who doesn't, didn't, doesn't believe that the, the, who believes that 9-11 was an inside job and that the, the towers were uh, controlled demolitions and that sort of thing. And uh, I start with his story because he um, traveled with a group of other 9-11 truthers to New York and they visited uh, Ground Zero. They went, they, they talked to um people who were architects uh, of the original World Trade Center. They learned how to fly a commercial airliner in uh, like a real simulation, uh, like the one you have to go and sit in an actual cockpit to use. Uh, they even landed a single engine airplane and uh, and they talked to demolition experts. It was all part of a, uh, an, a project to sort of see what would happen if they brought these people to, um, they gave them the evidence that we all wish we could give people. Sometimes we get into an argument like that where we disagree with someone and we think the facts are the way to get to them. Um, I start there because everyone who went on that trip went away believing even more that there, uh, that that it was a conspiracy, uh, except for one man who, um, came away from all of it going, I think I'm wrong. And he changed his mind about it. And he suffered a, a lot. He suffered from that. His, uh, he was excommunicated by the, his truther community and they attempted to ruin his life. Uh, they did all sorts of heinous things to him, including, uh, photoshopping images on members of his family and sending that to his mom, stuff like that. So I, uh, start there because I want to investigate this concept of, uh, there's a sort of a moral panic, especially in the States. And I'm sure it's everywhere that's on the internet that, uh, that we're in a post truth world where the, that facts don't matter anymore. And, um, I real I uh, I I don't agree with that. I uh, I think it has. I think the facts are just a part of the story. Clearly, people can be persuaded by facts if they're presented in a certain way. Uh, but you also have to take into account that um, addressing someone's beliefs, attitudes, or values at the level of their conclusions isn't really a great way of per- to persuade someone. You have to understand what motivates the person to cherry pick that evidence out of all the evidence available to them. What motivates them to defend a certain belief. Um, you also have to know whether you're dealing with an attitude or you're dealing with a belief or you're dealing with a value and you're attempting to persuade someone for, you know, if you, if, if someone says, uh, uh, ice cream is good, uh, chocolate ice cream is better than strawberry ice cream. That's not a belief. That's an attitude. Um, similarly, if someone says they think the current president is a bad person, um, it feels like you're trying to persuade them to believe differently, but what you're trying to persuade them to do is to feel differently about that. And it's a completely different persuasive technique when you're dealing with attitudes than it is with beliefs. And oftentimes attitudes lead to beliefs. And these are things that are that are not necessarily immediately uh, apparent or intuitively apparent when you start dealing with strange beliefs. Uh, I move on from there to talk to, I go to, um, I spend time with the people who study the dress. Uh, I felt like that was the best entry point to explain um, uh, priors and uh, something they call assimilation versus accommodation. I'm sure you remember the dress. Do you remember the dress? The the dress that some people see as blue and black and others as uh, yellow and white? Yeah, um, I do. Yeah, yeah. I know what you're it saying. It was the that. best because yeah. uh, I went to NYU and spent time with the neuroscientists there who uh, figured out why people see that differently and who took it even a step further and replicated it with socks and Crocs. Um, I wanted to use that as an illustration to show people that uh, if you see the dress one way, you can't see it the other way. And 
the if you get into an argument, this is similar to your coin uh, uh, metaphor earlier. Uh, if you get into an argument over that and you're trying to convince the other person that they're wrong and that you're right, that the way you see it is the only way that can, uh, could possibly be seen because you're not aware of the fact that other people can see it differently, um, you'll miss out on an opportunity to get to the truth. And that's something I use as a grand lesson in the book about uh, there's a big difference between a debate and uh, a big difference between an argument and a conversation, right? If you get into a debate, debates have winners and losers, and nobody wants to be a loser. And the only way to win a debate is to come away from the debate having learned nothing. And if both people, in, in the case of the dress, if we were to get into an argument over what is the actual color of it, um, me trying to convince you that the way I see it is the only way to see it wins nothing for either party. What you lose out on is the opportunity to get to the deeper truth, which is that um, the dress is neither color. It's uh, whatever color you see in your brain is uh, dependent upon the priors you're bringing to the, to the situation. People who've spent more time in sunlight tend to see it one way, and people who've spent more time in artificial light tend to see it in the other. And that's because when brains see things as being overexposed, uh, they try to, what they, they do is they call it in neuroscience, they subtract the luminant. And in, the brain also tries to figure out what color is the luminant that's, that's overexposing it. In the case of the dress, it's difficult to tell if it's in sunlight or artificial light. So people who've spent more time in sunlight will subtract blue from the dress because sunlight has more blue wavelengths. People who spent more time in artificial light will subtract yellow from it because there's more yellow in artificial light. And when you subtract yellow, you get the blue and black. When you subtract blue, you get the yellow and gold. Now, unaware that you're doing all that, you could end up arguing with the other person at the level of your perceptions and never get to the deeper truth of the whole thing. And... Uh, it's not very different from what happens when people argue over a political issue or argue over a conspiracy theory. What they're really arguing for is the way my brain's making sense of this is the only way a brain could make sense of this. And um, there's a billion terms for all of this in philosophy and psychology, but it's a good entry point to the whole thing. And uh, and from there, I go to Westboro Baptist Church and can talk to people who've left that and um, spend time with anti-vaxxers and flat earthers and the whole slew of things and eventually talk to people who who's who professionally persuade other people using a variety of persuasion techniques derived from psychology and neuroscience and explain to you the reader how you can use these techniques to be a better citizen of the internet or just uh, talk to your friends and family about things even even and and added things toward the end about how to do do a better job of convincing people who are anti-vaccine or, or have a conspiracy conspiratorial mindset toward uh covid to try to persuade them to see things differently yeah, brilliant. I, I, yeah, brilliant. I want to thank you. The, the work you're doing is, is fantastic and jumping into these topics and understanding sort of the core of what goes into people's beliefs is, is, is definitely something we can all sort of learn from as well. But what did, what did you learn on the journey? Was there anything that sort of new information that came up for you that you had to take a step back and say, hang on a sec, I might be wrong on this or sort of where do you stand on some of your opinions on some of the information, the people that you, you, you learned from uh was there anything you went oh i might have to look into this a little bit further <laughs> yeah the book starts out that way the book starts out saying i, I you're going to ch i changed my mind a lot about a many about many things in the process of writing this book um i think the thing that uh probably the deepest uh shift for me was thinking of um my first two books in my podcast for years have, have just talked about for one thing it's no point in trying to change people's minds i don't believe that anymore uh, I believe that it's actually quite easy and that it's one of our most, one of the most important things we have built into our brains is the, is the ability to update our understanding of the world. Uh, what's, what's important is understanding what happens when we resist that updating and what, what we can do to influence it. The other thing that really came away from was, uh, that came away from this was I often framed human reasoning as being uh, flawed and irrational. And um, that was sort of the take of a lot of pop psychology stuff uh, in the in the mid to late 2000s. I no longer see that. I no longer believe that at all. Um, I see human reasoning as biased and lazy, but not flawed and irrational. That's different. I think flawed suggests that it's there's something wrong or something in, uh, something is broken. Uh, human reasoning is doing exactly what it evolved to do, which is come up with reasons for what we think, feel, and believe for the purpose of uh, of justifying and explaining what we think, feel, and believe to others uh, for the sake of, of reputation management and also converging on goals and, and, and plans of action and, and, um, and all sorts of things that we do when we're trying to um, 
make sure that we that we are not incurring a strong social cost and we're getting all the social gains we can from group uh, argumentation and deliberations. So that so it's not flawed. Uh, it does exactly what it's meant to do, and it but and it's not um, irrational either. This is a very rational thing for a human to do, uh, for any creature to do. That that's sort of a social creature like ourselves. Uh, it is, however, biased because we reason from our perspective and from all the experiences we've had and from our motivations, uh, big and small. Um, and it is lazy because we tend to, to, to argue from the most justified, from the, from the, we tend to go with the thing that is easiest to justify before, any, before we go anywhere else. Uh, we don't tend to uh, reason from a place that has the most evidence behind it or is the most logical, we tend to reason from the place that is the most justifiable. So argumentation, the way I talk about it in the book, it's something that um, we evolved to uh, present very weak arguments as individuals for the sake of offloading the labor to a group deliberation process. And the thing is, on the internet, it can really feel like you're arguing as a group when really you're arguing alone. Uh, because it feels like we're all hanging out together, but really we're individually dumping a bunch of arguments onto a big mountain of arguments. And um, uh, we're instead of, um, it's like you think of it like uh, trying to figure out where you want to go eat with some, with like a group of friends. You know, like, and you present an argument that's like, hey, I, I think we should go get sushi. And then somebody else says, oh, no, I don't really think uh, sushi is, there's no good sushi places around here. What, you need to, what we need to go do is look for a, a a Thai place is a really good Thai place and there's sushi there if you want it. And then everybody has this like discussion until they zero in, right? They're just all producing these, the, their individual biased arguments and they zero in on what they're going to go do on the internet. What happens is uh, somebody says, I want sushi. And the other person says, I want Thai. And then the one person goes to finds, it says, well, who else wants sushi? And they go find all the other people who want that. And they go hang out with them. And the people who want Thai, they go find the people who want that and they go hang out with them. And they end up, the algorithm then, assists those people into forming communities based off their, their biases and their arguments. And they end up not deliberating and, and coming to some, any kind of consensus. So the it's doing exactly what it evolved to do. But uh, in that context, it can lead to some really strange effects, as we have seen all throughout the last uh, uh, about uh, eight years of weirdness in uh, politics across the globe. Um, so that, that's something I really changed my mind about, seeing it from a slightly different perspective. Yeah, I want to touch on the, the, the politics side as well. I did a book summary recently called Targeted by Brittany Kaiser. I'm not sure if you know the person or the book, but it's um, it's this one here. It's about how Donald Trump stole the election mm. with um, with Facebook and things like that. Yeah. But really, really simply, what they did, they just had a better system than um, than Hillary Clinton. And, and what it goes into was they were individually targeting individuals with specific information over a period of time to change their beliefs on a certain topic, whether they be um, a, a, make them not go out and vote or make them go out and vote or make them neutral. But the individual was targeted deliberately with certain information. So it just goes to show, hang on a sec, when you pull back the covers and you read the book, and I've done the summary, it's an hour on my website, no one else has done a summary on it, yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> um, very fascinating to understand as an individual how raw we are and how moldable we are to certain information. So once you realize that you can be persuaded, you can be changed, you can be proked and prodded and, you know, fake news and information and media, we're, we're totally bombarded until you take a step back and say, okay, what you know might not be the truth of the matter, even though you feel like you know know the truth. I'm very fascinated about propaganda and, you know, it's been going on for eons, but... Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting thing when you realize that people hold these certain beliefs dear to their heart that might not be true, <laughs> and they might have been sold a lie or they've bought a lie. So they're the two things. You've either been sold a lie or you've, or you've bought a mm -hmm. lie. Um, yeah, what, what, have you, do you know much about that, Cambridge Analytica or the book or the person? Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, and I've yeah. had to, I've had, I had, when the insurrection took place, uh, the, when the, when all those people stormed the capital in the United States, the, I had a, I did an episode of the podcast all about the, well, they took a really deep dive into the, what led to that. And uh, several people I spoke with, especially Gordon Pennycook, the psychologist, we really got into it. Um, there's uh, the, in anything like that, what you end up with is, uh, there's a couple of things that go into it that are, that are probably worth like highlighting the, the, I would say that on the, that, 
you know, so, uh, my friend Will Store, who writes bo similar books to mine, he he asked me one time, um, "Do you think you're right about everything?" And I was like, "Well, yeah, of course not." He goes, "Then what is it that you're wrong about?" And then you you know you can't answer the question because if you if the second you are 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 aware that you're wrong about something, you stop being wrong about it. Uh, so um, clearly, we're we're all wrong about a whole lot of stuff, and sorting out what is it is not true is tough. Uh, and since we don't have, uh, since we all have limited expertise, we have to depend on the expertise of somebody. And um, what ends up, I think, is probably like the root of most of what's happening and, and the strange discourse that's taking place and the epistemic crisis we find ourselves within, thanks to all of us looking at different stuff on the internet, is uh, we're not in a post-truth society, we're in a post-trust society. Uh, the information gatekeepers have fallen away. Um, and people are left to go try to figure out what, the, what they do and don't believe based off of all sorts of experiences they've had leading up to the present. And some people just do not trust certain institutions. Uh, they don't trust scientific institutions. They don't trust government institutions. They don't trust, uh, corporations or, uh, um, uh, drug conglomerates. There's all sorts of varying levels of trust. And, um, without there being a central source of information, and with trust being sort of uh, modulated by your political viewpoint, um, when you're in a post-trust environment, uh, it's difficult to parse what is and is not so. And it's also difficult to parse what is the proper attitude I should have toward things. In the case of the um, the Trump and everything that went along with that, uh, there are a, a lot of pockets of the United States where people are... Um, unsure who to trust and very hesitant to place any value on um, power structures that aren't derived from um, violence, the threat of violence, force, that sort of thing. Uh, they're economically unstable. There's a lot of racism. These are all things that, uh, a lot of xenophobia. These are all things that, that add up to anxieties that can be played upon. And um, they, uh, this was sort of an underappreciated voting block, I guess you'd say. This uh, they were there the the Alex Jones voting block, the uh, the, um, the 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 which has now become the Joe Rogan voting block in a lot of ways. Uh, that it's spread across all sorts of things. There's like the manosphere and the red pill and the Jordan Peterson and the the intellectual dark web and uh, but and uh, there's far right and there's also anarchy and there's a and then there are people, I find that there's a lot of crossover in things like Flat Earth, and, and it's strange, right? There's, it's an underappreciated political community that didn't have really anybody to, be, to speak for them. And then um, if you just uh, listen to a bunch of uh, talk, conspiratorial, uh, conspiratorially minded talk radio and repeat their their uh, talking points behind a, a lectern, you can get a lot of traction out of it. Um, the The thing is, like, when people try to persuade that group of people within a, within a community like that uh, to see things differently or see things their way or share their opinions and values, uh, it's very similar to how people try to argue with flat earthers where they attempt to uh, argue the facts of the matter and as if that's going to be the thing that, that switches them over to their way of seeing things. And it completely misses the, um, the motivation to have, to have walked into those, uh, the facts that they currently consider true uh, and address, you know, where the person is coming from and why, how they got there. Um, and when you fail at the level of, of, of facts and conclusions, you tend to think, well, this person's unreachable. This person's unpersuadable. I don't think anyone's unreachable or unpersuadable. I do think that people use poor techniques and then they, they think to themselves, I can't reach this person, but it's like trying to reach the moon with a ladder and then saying uh, the moon is unreachable. Well, you're just using the wrong tool. Um, with the insurrection, well, you had a um, a really interesting thing that happened there as well. Where uh, I'm just gonna okay, I'm just go gonna interrupt when you sorry. I think subconsciously you said reach the moon with a ladder. If you see my book behind there, Success in Fifty Steps, the cover is literally a ladder reaching to the moon. <laughs> no. can't you, can't you, you see it in the corner? That's a ladder with a moon. Oh, that's great! No, it's All too right. pixelated for me to see yeah. for my own. But that's that's wild. Uh, that's cool. I love that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's so good. Um, Sorry, continue. No, no, no. There's um, the way you um, 
one of the things I thought was really wild about that community that had went, went there was the, um, the, you, whenever, um, you get into this, this situation where you have all these people who are very pro, um, let's say you're very pro Trump or you're very pro and, and then you see what happened on, on January 6th and you start and you don't like what you saw. You don't like the idea of, of this sort of uh, this riotous act and the, the destruction of public property and, and, and disrespecting the the halls of democracy. So you end up with two competing attitudes, right? One attitude is Trump good. The other attitude, Trump supporter bad. And you start thinking to yourself, what do I do? You get, you get the cognitive dissonance starts to really uh, uh, boil up inside of a person whenever they get these two competing attitudes. And the easiest way out of that dissonance is to, instead of changing what you believe, change how you, instead of changing the facts of the matter, change your interpretation of the facts so that you can get out of the dissonance. And that's what you saw a whole lot. Uh, people, ha there's a, that's where a conspiracy, a second level conspiracy, conspiracy theory started to rise, which is, um, that was a false flag or those, that was Antifa. That was the government that, that was, there were, there were other, that was not actual Trump supporters, or if they were, those were people who were tricked in some sort of plan to like get them to go up there. And once you can, once you move into that belief, you're then uh, given the freedom to continue having a positive attitude toward the the movement, and that's how that's how conspiracy theories often escalate and ratchet themselves to to deeper and deeper levels of weirdness, because um, you're really attempting to assuage cognitive dissonance away from changing your mind, uh, and that's uh, something I, f I found really interesting about what happened on January sixth. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, and and. I sort of put it to the analogy of, um, as you said, people that agree with certain certain conspiracies or anything in life tend to go to the team that um, have the same beliefs. So they congregate in these mm. small little niches in the internet. Now, let's take the real world example, right? Like sport teams, for example. I foresee the future the seminars like sport teams where, let's just say Flat Earth, for example. You have all the flat earthers get together. You go to this seminar. It's like a sport, okay? So you have a small team of the experts in flat earth. And on the other side, you've got the experts in scientism and, and you know, heliocentric ball earth <laughs> theory, as they call it. Um, and you've got a referee and an umpire like yourself who, who deliberates the game. So for 30 minutes or for 15 minutes, you get the argument for flat earth. And then the scientists, 15 minutes. And you've got the crowd there watching, and it's literally back and forward mm -hmm debating mm -hmm. for like a long period of time, mm -hmm. like six hours, okay? And then they come back on Sunday, another one too. And it's like two teams that you would get more information on rationalizing and, and you know, cathartically talking about it to an audience instead of one person standing there on the lectern and going Bleh, for three hours about his opinion <laughs> and everyone walks away and think that's the truth. I think we would actually get somewhere if we turned it into a sport and had teams and you could literally. I I would uh, love I would like would... to believe that, but I'm afraid the sci the, the 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 literature suggests that would be the worst thing we could possibly do. Uh, no, no. <laughs> because uh, this there's a the moment you you put somebody on stage and allow them to debate a topic like that, um, all that really happens is that the audience that already felt positively toward one side will feel more positively toward that, and the person that already felt positively toward the other side will feel more positively toward that, and nobody in the audience pretty much will change their mind, and the people on stage won't either. It's very good. It's a good show. It feels good. It feels like something we ought to be doing. It feels like something that that is uh, ethical and moral and and, and democratic and high-minded and academic, but it's absolutely the worst thing we could possibly do because people don't work this way. Um, in uh, opinion uh, in the psychology of persuasion and opinion science, there are these two things called technique rebuttal and topic rebuttal. So what you're talking about is topic rebuttal, and that is wonderful if everybody's playing the same language game and everybody's uh, in a good faith environment. So if you're you got doctors, you've got lawyers, you've got engineers, you've got um, scientists uh, in a particular discipline. Everyone has agreed to play the same game. Like if, if you're talking about, let's say, biologists, you know, they're like, we're going to use a scientific method. We're going to uh, uh, try to use null a null hypothesis. We're going to try to disconfirm our assumptions and try to zero in on, the, on and build evidence. To, and we're going to have all these different hypotheses. 
And the one that has the hypothesis that has the most supporting evidence is the one that we'll say is the provisional explanation for the thing. And if that gathers enough evidence, can it can be promoted into a theory. But even at that level, there's other people that are going to have to be vetted forever and ever. And there may be new tools and new evidence. And that's topic rebuttal. And it only works if if all parties are agreeing to the same rules. But when you have a, a flat earther having a conversation with a scientist, they are not playing the same game. They are not agreeing to the same good faith environment. They are not using the same epistemology. And if they're not using the same epistemology, then topic rebuttal does not work. You, instead, what you have to use is something called technique rebuttal. Technique rebuttal is the attempt to understand how, what, by what process and reasoning and what epistemological framework did, did, you, did the person that you're debating arrive at their conclusions. And the, the good news is that talk, topic rebuttal and technique rebuttal have an equal success rate, but they only work in the proper, you have to have the right context to use one. You have to know what context you're in to use one or the other. And when it comes to technique rebuttal, what you need to do, first thing you need to do is, is, uh, is it okay if I run through the steps with you? Yeah, please. Yeah, okay. Definitely. So here's yeah. what I suggest. And there are, there are a number of frameworks for this. Uh, there's something called street epistemology. There's something called motivational interviewing. There's something called smart politics. There's something called deep canvassing. Uh, there are dozens of models for using technique rebuttal. It, it, Socratic method is, is another example. Um, and in this domain, first thing that's important is you must establish rapport with the other person. Uh, that could take days. If you have a really bad relationship, if it's like you know your dad or something where you've been arguing for years it may take a quite a while to build rapport but uh if it's a stranger it, it's easier to build rapport than someone you have a relationship that's already negative so but what's important is you have to do it the reason is the other person cannot frame you as an other uh there can't be an us and the, us versus them taking place um that's because we're social primates that are very concerned with reputation management and and getting this feeling of uh, if I do see things another way, will I be shamed by the other by the person I'm talking to? Uh, if I do see things a certain way, will I be shamed? And if I change my mind, will I be shamed by the people that I'm with or, that are already on my side? So if you say anything that could be interpreted as you should be ashamed for thinking that, uh, you you will lose immediately, and the, all the other steps won't work. So you have to enter into a good like a report. You have to enter a stage where you feel like you and the other person are solving a mystery together. Uh, like we're going to try to figure out where, how you came to these ideas and we're going to work together on it because our goal here is we both want to be correct. Um, so then the next thing you would do is if it's a fact-based issue, if it's an attitude-based issue, you want to go with motivational interviewing. But in this case, it's a fact-based issue because it's, uh, it's what is the earth flat or is it a globe? So you ask for a very specific claim and then you confirm that you understand the person's claim because by repeating it back in their own words. And you want to make sure that um, you you clarify all their definitions. They may be using words differently than you. And if they are, you want to use the words, use those words in the way that they're using them. So you're not, you're trying to make sure you're staying in their frame. Uh, and once you've got all that in front of you, you need to ask for a numerical measure of confidence in their claim. So zero to 10 or zero to 100, how confident are you that this one thing that we're talking about is true? And once you get that number, you can ask, um, why is it not higher? Why is it not lower to sort of sort out where they're at and how they came to it because you you want to get to this point where you're asking what reasons do you have to hold that level of confidence and once they've given you a very specific reason for why they hold that level of confidence ask them what method they're using to judge the quality of that reason and this is where you spend the rest of your conversation because you're uh you, what you're trying to do is get the other person to understand that they are using some sort of epistemology even if they have never really uh articulated that to themselves or anyone else and it may be very obvious in that it, once they do articulate it, that it's not a really great way to come to settle on a conclusion. And they could have come to, any, come to a different conclusion. And when a person becomes open to the idea that they, they could have come to a different conclusion or other people could come to a different conclusion using that same epistemology, that's almost all you have to do. Uh, for the rest of the conversation, you can just listen, summarize, and repeat and uh, ask if you can have further conversations from there. Any, tech, any persuasive technique that follows sort of that framework there's a million ways you can um, you can sort of improvise inside of that framework uh, has a much higher rate of success than ever talking about like here are the facts here's your facts here's my facts here's your facts uh, here's my expert here's your expert never goes anywhere but the exploring another person's reasoning and their justification systems and their uh, epistemology way more successful so they and they call that technique rebuttal anyone who's listening who wants to uh, 
explore this. Uh, just look up topic rebuttal and technique rebuttal. There are a number of papers that, uh, that have been published here recently sort of exploring the two. And if you want to get deeper into it, uh, there's uh, street epistemology, deep canvassing, smart politics, motivational interviewing. Those are all frameworks that use that. And they have, with, with motivational interviewing, you have 40 years of research that you can dive into and see how it works. Spot on. Um, thank you for sharing. And, and yeah, it sounds very technical and sounds very, you know, uh, you have a science psychology degree <laughs> like yourself. But um, I want to get really sort of uh, selfish and talk about a topic that's come to my okay. mind recently and, and, and show you how easy it is. And you can probably, I want you to sort of correct me on this, how sticky conspiracies get. Yeah. And when I mean sticky, so went to see a friend recently, shout out to Jimmy, uh, he knows who he is. And he goes, oh, you've heard about Tartaria, have you? And I was like, what's Tartaria? He's like, you know, the Tartaria mud flood, how history is a lie. I was like, no, I haven't heard about that. He goes, I'll give you a book. So he gave me a book. And as I'm in the book space and like to do summaries, I read the book and I read the book, um, you know, one of those cover to cover in, in one sitting. And I thought, oh God, oh, here we go down the rabbit hole again. I have to make a summary of it. I released a summary. It's called the Tartaria mud flood. Have you heard about this yourself? Uh, I have. Or, this is a new, this is a new one. Uh, it's a new one. It's the latest. It's the latest and greatest. Anyway, so in the book, it, um, I live in Melbourne, Australia, and it's about how there was a mud flood maybe 200 years ago and all the buildings, um, you know, one or two stories down. And it's a really, really good summary, and it opens your eyes up to say, hey, maybe there's something in this. Long story short, did the book summary. Didn't think too much of it. Um, talked to a few people about it. They've never heard of it as well. I was in the city on the weekend and then noticed the buildings from the book, how they're underground and all the windows and whatnot. So I took a whole bunch of photos. Yeah. Now, I'm a research guy. So now I'm like, okay, I want to research about the city, the history, the, the timeline, the dates. I want to disprove it. So my whole theory now is I've heard the conspiracy. I've, I've watched all the you know documentaries on BitChute. Shout out to BitChute, who's the opposite of YouTube. It's the old torrents back in the day where you can go on there and download six-hour documentaries about the lost history and flat earth. And as a res I'm a researcher, not a conspiracy theorist, so I want to disprove it. So now I'm on the bandwagon of, okay, I'm going to exert some energy on trying to disprove this particular theory. But the more I'm researching, <laughs> the more I'm, oh, the more I'm, yeah, I'm sort of now turning it, not into an advocate, but I'm talking to people about it to see if they've heard about it. And I apologize if I'm sending you down another rabbit no, hole. No, I love these. So. What? I, I, I want to know, what what do I do from here about continuing to research it and sort of disprove it? <laughs> and I don't want to strengthen my belief, but I haven't had any... I'm looking for um, opinions that go against the grain of what I understand. Sure. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, look, uh, I will let you know, I'll tell you that most flat earthers, this is how, this is the same. This, most conspiratorial, conspiratorial communities, this is how people on board. Uh, many people uh, attempt to disprove something, and uh, what ends up happening is they go, "Oh, now I believe it," and then now, and then they go like, and what the next step is to go talk to other people to see what they think, and uh, you end up finding other people who've had that same experience, and oh no, now you're in a little club, oh no, now we're meeting each other, oh no, now we're going to to, uh, to conventions, oh no, now we have a dating app that's only for us because uh, the <laughs> because <laughs> you need to, that's a like deal breaker right off the bat, so. Um, so that's not uncommon. Uh, that's the onboarding process. It's also the process of radicalization. It's also how people get into uh, communities that uh, have done very heinous things throughout history. Uh, and it's also how people get into those communities off f through the Internet. Uh, the algorithms are very good once you start exploring something, showing you bunches and bunches of content that will uh, that allow you to take deeper and deeper dives. Um, the only way out of this is to is metacognition, right? Um, You've got to think about your own thinking. Uh, that you can get stuck in something called the the conspiratorial logic loop, and this conspiratorial logic loop works like this: any once you have a suspicion that something might be true, and there might be a conspiracy afoot, any missing evidence can be uh, explained as part of the cover up. Any evidence that seems to disconfirm the theory can be seen as part of the theory a red herring or a false flag put in put in there to take put you off the trail so if what you've done now is you've entered into a logic loop and there's no escaping because you are unable to to uh create a null hypothesis and build evidence for it because you have 
limited yourself. If it's if evidence if there's if there's missing evidence, it's part of the theory. In fact, oh, the theory, the the conspiracy must be very big indeed. If it's uh, if there's disconfirming evidence, oh, that must be part of the theory. Oh, the the conspiracy must be very big indeed. And that's that's how you end up in sort of this death spiral that will lead you to needing to find some other people who are like yourself so that you won't feel so ostracized from the people around you who think you've gone insane. And once you find those people and you have a community of people like that, you get trapped in the deeper loop, which is the, the social primate loop of, of belonging and inclusion and wanting to, to have a community of others that you can hang out with. So that's my warning to you. OK, that's a that's something that can happen. Yeah. If you want out of this, yeah, I appreciate. I, I I really really appreciate that. And I, I guess what happens is, so yesterday I was I was researching old photos of the city, like from 150 years to 100 years ago, and I was looking for the evidence to, as you said, those missing links. But what happens is when I start to talk to people who have never heard about it before, they get curious. They're like, "Wow, well, yeah, that makes sense." And that's conf- <laughs> and it's like I'm I'm looking for someone not to debate, but someone just to say, "Hey." I don't think you've you, you've thought about X, Y, and Z, right. but I guess that's how sticky these things become because it got stuck to me. Then I stick it to someone else. Yeah. All of a sudden, they're looking at the stuff in in new eyes, and um, well, that's it the just thing, goes right? Round and round. There's and no, round. there are no. Yeah. You, it's no stop. You need to go. You. The only way out of this is to uh, accept a. You're not an expert on this topic, uh, and um, reading. Even read, if you read 12 books about this, you still would not be an expert on it. What you need to do is find people who have spent their entire lives researching. Uh, in this domain, it would be like architecture and archaeology and, and city planning and, and, and this sort of thing. And yeah. reach out to an archaeologist who works at a university and say, hey, I've been looking at this. What do you think? Now, this is where the conspiracy stuff is most dangerous because if you don't trust that sort of academic source then then you really are starting to to hit on how conspiracies happen in the first place if you don't trust academia if you don't trust archaeologists who do you trust you do you and if you've entered into a frame where i can't trust these experts who do you consider an expert and how does one become an expert and what ends up happening what's happened with flat earth is they don't trust experts to the point that they feel like they have to start all over again and do their own experiments. And what they've basically done is gone back to the 17 and they've gone back to the, to the enlightenment. <laughs> they've gone back to like the 16 and 17 hundreds and they're redoing experiments from that era because they don't trust science to the point that they feel like they have to restart all the whole thing. The entire astronomical like literature has to be rewritten. And if that's where you want to go, as long as you're using the scientific method, you know, more power to you. But um, do you know that like at some point, you have to ask yourself, who do I trust? Who do I not trust? And why? Like, why do I feel this way? And when you, yeah. if you start going down that rabbit hole, you're much more likely to escape the other rabbit hole, I think. Yeah. No, you're, you're right. Yeah, you're definitely right. But the, the, the biggest thing at the moment, I guess, is the distrust in mainstream media around the world. Yeah. And, you know, and everyone puts in that particular bucket, governments, media, academia and then when they realize hang on a sec you know i've been sold a lie my whole life now i don't believe anyone and that's where the whole fallacy of the scientific method drops and they go you know what i'm just going to go do my own research now and become a an armchair an armchair expert as they say but look we could we could talk about this for ages yeah, I know we're sure. over time so um <laughs> i'll definitely have to get you back on when it when is the book coming out it's not even released yet is it's it? not released yet it got, they pushed it back for covid reasons uh but it'll come out in may uh but you can we can pre-order it right now uh but it does come yeah. out in may and if you're interested in any of this stuff on my podcast you are not so smart i um you can listen to me talk to experts on these topics and you basically can see behind this it's basically like behind the scenes of the re- of a lot of the research that i did so i've already covered a lot of these yeah. topics on certain episodes i like how you've you put yourself down you say you're not so smart but uh david you're you're one smart man <laughs> um i'm definitely going to follow you on your podcast how long have you been on the on the podcast journey for um six years i've been doing it for six years wow wow okay to my audience go out there and check out the podcast one last question before we wrap up and uh if you were to host a dinner party with three people uh, from the past, dead or alive, who would they be? What would you serve them and where would you take them to? Oh, wow, okay. Three people from the past. Three people from the past. Uh, see, Alan Watts, Carl Sagan, and um, let's see, uh, George Carlin. And 
I would uh, take them to an oyster bar and uh, we would uh, drink uh, Bloody Marys until uh, until we stopped uh, uh, blowing smoke each other, up at each other's ass and just started laughing and telling stupid jokes. I think that would be a cool afternoon. That would be cool. George Carlin, Carl Sagan, and Alan Watts. Yeah, that would be interesting uh, conversation <laughs> with oysters and uh, Bloody Marys. Uh, yeah, David, thank you for being on the show. And uh, sort of where can – you've already said where can people find you, so the podcast, but where do you sort of hang out socially yourself? Uh, you can, you know, davidmcraney.com will find everything. I'm on uh, Twitter, at David McCraney, M-C-R-A-N-E-Y. Uh, the podcast is uh, You Are Not So Smart. It's on Twitter, at not smart blog yes it was a blog before it was anything and now i'm stuck with that stupid uh twitter handle but that's how you find all my stuff yep and uh, i'm going to steal this one from tim ferris which i heard the other day he asked his audience he asked david blaine there was if you had one billboard and uh, you had one message to leave uh on a billboard what would it be uh yeah what are you wrong about <laughs> yes what you... that's a good one what are you wrong about <laughs> I I gonna ask myself that every day. Um, David, thank you for being on the Best Book Bits podcast. Oh, You've been a great guest. Hey, thanks and for having audience, me. Go out and follow you and check out your podcast and pre-order your book and yeah, dive into the old books which we didn't get into <laughs> at all in this episode. But uh, that's okay. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much, David. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you very much. All right. Cheers. Bye. Right, bye.